News Afternoon has already started on BBC One. Here on two now, Rock School on strings and tuning. <laughs> schools orchestra with a uh, perfect pitch and then went into a band that tuned to a harmonica and uh, <laughs> it drove me crazy for years I mean I always felt that we sounded out of tune eventually um, it disappeared you know it, it was forced out and now if you told me to sing an atty I go hey well as you might have guessed this week we're going to be talking about tuning Tuning is a problem that every band has to face. It concerns every instrument, not least the drums. Uh, the drums have a very wide range of pitches. But first, we're going to start looking at the guitar and bass. And the vital components with tuning on these instruments are the strings. Now, string pitch is determined by the length of the string, by the thickness of the string, and also by the tension. Now, on guitar and on bass, the length of the string is predetermined, it doesn't, it doesn't alter. So the only variables are the thickness and the tension. So the thicker the string, the lower the pitch. On the guitar, the thickest, heaviest string gives you the lowest note, like this. And the lightest, thinnest string gives you the highest note, like this. Now the thickness or the diameter of the strings is usually referred to as the gauge, and you buy your strings in sets. Now, whether you use a heavy set or a light set of strings will depend on your personal choice and the kind of role that you play in the band. I, the strings I use are, I think, a little heavier than, than most people use. And I like the action high-ish. You see, I don't go for playing six million notes really fast or anything, so I don't want the action right down. It's more for the sound. <laughs> The gauge of strings you use should be really the heaviest you can, you can manage to do what you want to do with, because the heavier a string is, the, the better the sound you're going to get from it. It gives a, a louder and a truer note if it's, if it's a tighter, heavier string. So, as Wilco says, a heavier gauge of strings will give you a louder, truer note, you'll find you'll get a bit more sustain and they'll stay in tune a bit longer. The advantage of a lighter gauge is that vibrato and string bending will be a lot easier. So really, you've got to make the choice. You can get different gauges of bass strings too, but bass players are more concerned with the type of string they use. Now, all bass strings are wound, but the difference is basically in the binding. There are three types. There's round wound, flat wound, and ground wound. For round wound strings, there's a central plane core which has rounded wire wrapped around it. They give a bright sound and a touch more sustain. Flat wound strings have the same plane core but with a flat metal tape wrapped around it. They give you a punchier, more middly tone. Ground wounds are a combination of the two, being round wound strings shaved down and polished to make them feel like flat wounds. We went out and asked a few bass players what sort of strings they preferred and why? I used to use flat wound strings when I started off with white snake because the middliness of them really poked through. They're very hard to play, so I sort of gave that a rest and found a compromise um, with more ground wound strings, which are like round wounds that have been shaved down a bit. So they don't have so much twang on the top, um, but they still got a fairly middly sound. The round wound, the round wound. The rough boys, you know, make you, make you have to scuffle for it, you know. And, um, you know, I don't know, it seems like they, they have a better tone. I don't think they, I don't know if they last too long, but, you know, 
I mean, as far as the sound and the roughness and, you know, I like, you know, that kind of thing, you know. They get a real good sound out of it, especially on stage, too, and in the studio. I used uh, Flat Wound on the first two albums, but after that I changed. Especially Why? for the, well, the slapping sound, you get more, you know, you get a better sound, you get a more crisp sound, more pop, you know, when you're doing this type of stuff. You know, you get a better tone, but a flat, you know, with the uh, flat wound, you get something like this. And it's not really as clear, you know. And I really can't demonstrate it when I have any actual strings here. But you like to have that, that, you know, pop, that pop there, that crisp sound like. Once you've chosen the type of strings, you've got the problem of keeping them in tune. Now, on the guitar, the strings are usually tuned to the following notes, starting with the lowest string. It's E, A, D, G, B, and E. The bass strings are the same as the bottom four strings of the guitar, but they're a lot lower in pitch, like this. E, A, D, and G. You can find these notes on a piano or on pitch pipes, or you can use one of these. This is an electronic tuner. It means that you can actually tune each string visually by looking at this gauge here and seeing exactly when you're in pitch. But probably the most popular method is still to tune the guitar to itself. Now to do this you need to get at least one string in tune and then you use the fifth fret method like this. sure about this you'll find that lots of books will tell you how to do this. Another way you can tune up is you using the harmonic method. Now a note played on the bass consists of a main note or a fundamental and overtones or harmonics but you don't usually hear those when when you play the main note. Now the harmonics can be brought out using this technique. You place your finger above the fret resting on the string but make sure that you don't depress the string onto the fingerboard and then you pluck with the right hand like this and as you do that make sure that you move your finger out of the way and again now you'll find that there are harmonics all over the bass and I'll just show you Now, this, the best place for harmonics are on the 5th fret, here, on the 7th fret, here, and on the 12th fret. Now, when you tune up, all you have to do is 5th fret harmonic on the E string is the same note as the 7th fret harmonic on the A string, like this. So, play the two together. They should be perfectly in tune. Now, now, you'll notice there's an oscillation because the strings are slightly out. As I tune up, the pitch gets closer, the oscillation stops. Now, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is string voicings. Because on the guitar and bass, you can play the same notes, same pitch, but in different places on the fingerboard. But because the strings have got different qualities, they're different thicknesses, you'll find they give a slightly different sound. So if I play this phrase on the top strings like this, it's quite a bright trebly sound. I'll move to the lower strings like this. Here that the sound is a little bit more bassy and perhaps a little richer. Now you can try and use this in your playing like this. So if you're listening to records and you learn to recognise the different string qualities, it means that you'll be able to figure out exactly where the guitarist is playing phrases. By tuning your guitar or bass in this particular way, you've imposed a particular order of sounds. Now there's a reason for that, and understanding that reason will enable you to tune properly and also to play very well. So first of all, let's look at sounds. Two sounds play together creates harmony. Now, the distance between sounds are described as intervals, and when two sounds are played at the same time, 
they're called harmonic intervals. Now, when two sounds are played in the form of a melody, like this, that's called a melodic interval. Now, the smallest interval on the bass is called a semitone, and it looks like this. The distance of a semitone is marked by one fret. Now, the next smallest distance is a tone. That is marked by two frets, like that. Now, listen to this sound. That interval is called an octave. Scales are ways of splitting the octave and using equal steps. Um, the major scale has steps of tones and semitones. This is the pattern for a major scale. Tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. For a minor scale, this is the pattern. Tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone, tone. Remember, for a major or minor scale, keep the pattern in your mind, and then you can repeat the pattern on different notes and in different keys. However, we're not going to look any more at scales now. We're going to show you now how intervals and scales are vital for building chords. Of course, you could learn thousands of chord shapes out of a book off by heart, but it's much more interesting if you understand how chords are formed. So, we're going to look at two basic chord types, the major and the minor. Now, to form a major chord, we're going to go back to the major scale and number the notes from one to eight, like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, to form a major chord, you take the first, the major third, and the fifth from the scale. Play them together, like this. To form a minor chord, you do the same thing. You take the first, the minor third, that's the third from the minor scale, and the fifth and you play the notes together to form a minor chord like this. Now notice when you play these two shapes that there's only one note different between them. The major chord has got a major third. It's that note there. The minor chord has got the minor third and it's like the major third flattened by one semitone or one fret. Drums have different voices too. And by recognising these different voices, you can copy licks off records and work out different patterns and so on. We'll be looking at this throughout the series. And in recent years, uh, drummers have had access to more exotic sounds, like these rotor toms. Bali. Or even these syndromes. Now, to get the best out of the main kit requires very careful tuning. In fact, tensioning is probably a more accurate term since most drummers don't tune to specific notes. So, when drummers talk about tuning, generally they're talking about the overall feel and sound of the drum when it's struck. All you can say is when, when the drum pleases you when you hit it, it's in tune. Because nobody can tell you a drum is out of tune. If, it's, if, it's, if the drum is fighting with itself, so that if you've got a two-head drum and the, and the skins are actually mismatching, then you can tell that's out of tune. But whether you tune it high or you tune it slack, you know, if it's in tune and it sounds good to your ear, then don't ask for anything more. Uh, so to say how you tune it. What my preference is, I tune my snare drum very high. Uh, I like it to be sharp and positive, and I don't like a lot of duration on the note. The toms are like exactly the reverse. I like them deep, and I like an after note. So when you hit the drum, you get the initial tension of the impact, and then you get the roll off as the skin relaxes and comes back to its normal tension. Unlike the guitar and the bass, tuning the drums is a very personal thing. Um, starting from scratch, it can take quite a long while, and it's one hell of a headache for a lot of drummers. But there are a few tips that might help, I think. Uh, starting with these tom-toms, they can be single-headed, like these over here, which means there's a head on the top and nothing underneath. Or, like these over here, 
They can be double-headed with a head on the top and a head below. OK, for tuning purposes, start with a single head, which is obviously a little bit easier. OK, now we take everything off. Good idea to get a duster and clean all the uh, bits of chewing gum and dead spiders from around the, the rim here. It, all sorts of stuff collects. And also, it's a good idea to uh, tighten up all these little bolts inside because they do come loose with heavy playing. Right, take the head, put it onto the shell. Now we take the steel rim, place that over, and the bolts go into the nut boxes like this. And what I usually do is tune them, take them up, finger tight like this. So you take up this little quarter of an inch here until they're finger tight. Now I'll move over onto this one here, which we've got to finger tightness. As you can see, it's not tuned. So the next thing you do is you take the drum key and working diagonally, give a turn on each key, working diagonally like this. What you're trying to do, of course, is to give the same number of turns on every one and bring it up to approximately the sort of feel that you like. So we get to something like... Not too bad. Now we give it a fine tune. What I mean by this is you do, rather similar to what a classical timpanist does, you go clockwise round like this and tap about an inch and a half, two inches away from the bolt as you go round, giving a little turn, until you've got the whole head in tune with itself. This is what you're trying to do, trying to get even tension all the way over. If you do that, you'll find that you'll get a much cleaner and more penetrating sound out of the drum. Having done that, there are all sorts of tricks that drummers use, like slackening this one off a quarter turn. That gets rid of a bit of the extra ring, gives it a slightly funkier sound. But basically, you're after even tension. Now, moving on to the double-headed toms, a bit more complicated, obviously. There are three possibilities. You can have the top head a little bit slacker than the bottom head. You can have the top head a little bit more taut than the bottom head or you can have them both the same. Now that last uh, possibility isn't usually recommended because it rather defeats the purpose of having two heads on your drums. Also, you can run into tuning problems, a bit like we saw with the bass guitar. You can get oscillations between the two heads when they're almost in beats. Uh, you don't want that. So what most drummers do is tune the top head as we did this single-headed drum, get a nice feel on that, and then tune your bottom head up to give you the tone. So it's a sort of rule of thumb, top head feel, bottom head for tone. And it's probably true to say that more people have the bottom head a little bit higher uh, than the other way around, but as I say, there, there are no rules. The other thing to be said about um, single head and double heads is that the single heads uh, tend to give you a little bit more power because there's nothing stopping the sound from coming out of the bottom, whereas these, uh, the sound goes backwards and forwards inside the shell, so you get a bit more tone. OK, moving on to the, uh, the snare drum. The snare drum, in fact, is a shallow tom-tom, as you can hear. But, of course, it's got this wire snare stretched over the bottom. And uh, it's got a transparent head on the bottom, as you can see, which is quite thin. So it doesn't take all that many turns to get it to quite a sort of pingy a high sort of pingy sound so that even though you've tuned your top fairly taut to get a nice crisp sound uh, the bottom usually will be a little bit higher than the top um, one final uh, thing to say about uh, tension in drums is that uh, again unlike the bass and the guitar you may have to adjust according to the acoustics of the room or the studio or whatever so don't be afraid to experiment now then we've got them all tensioned nicely you may still have to put a bit of damping on because you might have a bit of excessive ring. So, uh, traditionally, the drum manufacturers had felt dampers which screwed up underneath the back head like this. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is it impedes the downward movement when you strike it. And also, rock drummers have never been very keen on them because they're, they're not really strong enough for rock playing. So, uh, as you probably noticed, external damping of some form or another is very often used. Uh, usually takes the form of horrid bits of tape stuck over the edge of the skin like this. The effect it has is instead of this ring, you get a bit of it cut out. A bit more like that. In studios, uh, damping is very common, uh, but in fact, the range is enormous, as we found when we went and talked to a couple of drummers with very, very different styles. Well, I will put a lot of damping on the kit so we can get not directly a dead sound, but almost dead, because we think it sounds better on the recording. Some some people record with like sounding live. For instance, this is dead, almost dead. Yeah, this is 
like sound like a pan. We don't want to pan some, but no one really likes it. So put the damper on. Put the sound so you... uh, Damping. I try and use as little as possible. Uh, it's it's very easy to get away with virtually no damping on the smaller tom toms. Uh, the bigger the drum gets, the more overtones you get, the longer the ring, and then you you have to help a little bit and use some top head damping, but very very gently so that the damp the damper only comes into effect once you've hit the drum. Another fa factor is the type of stick that you use. This is entirely personal preference and, of course, the uh, type of music you're playing. Sticks are usually made out of wood. Hickory and oak are the commonest. And when you're choosing a stick, especially if you're having to buy cheapish ones, always roll it on the counter like this, on the horizontal counter of the shop. If it's warped at all, you'll soon notice. Now, again, when we went out and asked some famous drummers about their stick preferences, we got some really revealing answers. Uh, I'm not very fussy about drumsticks. So long as they're the right length, and for general format, it's about 16 inches for me, and the right diameter, which I think is about 9 sixteenths or 5 eighths, 9 sixteenths, I think, um, and the weight is right, I don't actually care what shape they are. Um, in this situation, I'm using the sticks as they should be used, bead end out. On stage, I'm going to say it's totally the reverse thing. Right? All, all I really need on stage is, is absolute power, and this probably gives me another 20 dB. I find that this particular part here, the neck of the stick, is one of the most important parts because this bit here, I don't like to have any gain, any whip or any movement there. And a lot of drums, I don't know if you can see that on camera, but that doesn't really move that much. And a lot of drum sticks you buy give a little there. When they give, they actually sound different. But this here is a little bit thicker than norm and it feels very positive. I mean, when I play, I can feel down the drumstick as a continuation of my arm and it feels real good. Well, I use his um, Duraline 6 to 5. Well, the Duraline is in my left hand, and I use it as a regal to combo in the right hand. Two different sticks, two different sizes. Why? Um, because, uh, for instance, you're playing like this, right? This part of the stick is much heavier. This part is lighter, right? So it's unbalanced. What I do, I use a smaller stick, like the combo is much smaller than this. This combo is almost the size of here, so I have a two and being the same. And what I do is put some tape like this around here to balance back this end and cut off some of the notes of the hi-hat. So when you're playing, instead of getting, you don't get, you get. So it's all glide with the music. And you have much more control over the hi-hat. We're going to leave you this week with a number featuring the different voices of the drums and cymbals. Henry's going to play bass harmonics and I'm going to play octaves in a slightly different way. So until next week. A leaflet containing information about forming a band, care of equipment and where to get tuition is available by sending a stamped address envelope 12 inches by 9 inches to Rock School, BBC Television.